So we're missing a few people. Hopefully they will join us soon. Uh, welcome to the Wednesday, November 2nd, 2022 meeting of the Community Preservation Committee. Uh, as always, we begin our meetings with general public comment. So if there's anyone out there wishing to comment on anything CPC related, please do so at this time. Uh, I see a hand, Claudia. Hi, good evening. Um, thanks for letting me speak. Um, I have two things to say. One is I'm hoping that, you know, last time when there was very few people on the, the Zoom meeting, maybe a couple, three people from the public, but, but after we made public comment, we weren't allowed to ask questions or comment on the discussion. So I'm, I'm just um, reflecting back to you that, that some of these meetings, I think historic, uh, the historic commission, when people are in the audience, they have let us participate in the conversation, as long as it doesn't seem to, I know the meetings can go on and on, <clears throat> but I'm wondering why it isn't possible as the meeting proceeds, if there are questions, because I think the good news is that now the public, at least my, me speaking for myself, I'm interested in what the CPC is doing. So if I, have questions, it would be easiest if, if I was allowed or anybody who has questions to participate, you know, when they come up in the meeting. And that seems to, would save everybody time. And I don't have to email Sarah or somebody to say, well, what about this or that? So if you would consider that, that would be great. And in fact, it seems when the meetings were in person and it was small, you know, small committees, it was the, the standard that the people in the audience would often would be able to participate in the meeting. So that's my first thing. And my second thing is I know you're talking, I see on the agenda about outreach tonight. And I'm hoping that in addition to the outreach that 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 you do more outreach, that there's a way, you know, I know that this is all hooked up with the planning department, that the people in the planning department, you know, know who's perhaps making proposals proposals or whatever. So I'm thinking about 107 William Street. It's like a vacant lot. Now they knocked the house down. And I'm wondering if the man who could not sustain 107 William Street knew about CPC money because it's a big lot and it's an affordable house, whether he might have been directed to make some sort of a proposal to the committee. So I guess my question is how much the planning department is able to funnel people like a developer who comes to you that they might be able to to do something different than put maximum housing on that they might be able to be directed towards CPC money that would would conserve the property and save a small house or whatever. So just to say that it seems part of the issue here is the how much CPC you know is is publicly hooked up and how much is CPC actually uh, working in coordination with the planning department. So that's that's my comment for tonight. I am curious to know if we could continue to ask questions or comment, you know, as the meeting goes on. So thanks. Thank you, Claudia. Uh, Penny or Pennington? Yeah. Pen Penny is what everybody calls me, even my mother when she was mad at me. Um, I'm here because of the agenda item on affordable housing in Leeds. And I want to confirm that when there was a meeting about this, um, I assume this is the property on Evergreen Street. And that when there was a meeting in the neighborhood about that, we had the close neighbors pretty much all came out and were in favor of having affordable housing there. They had hoped, we had all hoped then that Habitat would be building the house and there were a number of people who said they would volunteer to help. I think Habitat is no longer planning to do that. I want to emphasize that it's a really small lot, very close to the houses that are on either side of it. And at the, people wanted it to be a single family home and Wayne, committed to that, that it was his preference also that that be a single family home. So I don't know what you're gonna talk about tonight, but that's 
brings you the Leeds perspective. Um, I, I am the president of the Leeds Civic Association. Thank you. Any other public comments that folks want to share? Now is the time. Um, well, let me try to respond to a few of the issues that just came up. One, Pennington, uh, two weeks from now at the November 16th meeting, there will be, uh, the whole meeting is just public comments. It's where we hear folks speaking on all of the proposals. Tonight, we're hearing the presentations by uh, those seeking the grants, in this case, Carolyn for the city, um, looking at the Leeds Affordable Housing Project. So we won't be uh, debating that proposal. We'll simply be asking questions of the applicant. Um, and you're welcome to stay for the meeting and, and listen to that. Uh, and also to come in two weeks and comment specifically on those proposals. And if there are other folks from the Leeds group that wish to do so, that's the best, the best time for that. Um, just a couple of responses to Claudia, what you said. One is we put the CPA outreach, uh, thanks to your suggestion, put that on the agenda tonight. So we recognize that uh, we're certainly open, open to open to comments. Um, and uh, and the issue of uh, of uh, public asking questions is that um, the issue that 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 we have, and I can defer to Sarah on this or other committee members as well, is that we've had a chance to read the proposals. Now I assume some folks in the all those proposal are obviously public and are listed on the website. Um, we've had a chance to ask questions in writing to the applicants. We've had a chance to review what those answers to those questions are. Um, so I think part of the need to expedite some of, 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 of this is um, to not be redundant in asking questions when that information is already been posted on the on the web by people and that that uh, you may agree or disagree with that, but I think it's a it's a way to expedite stuff. Uh, historically, that's this is the way that we've done uh, business, and it seems to have worked well in the past. If there are issues that, like with the CPA outreach thing, if you had specific ideas, I think we'd be certainly willing to to call on the public in terms of entertaining ideas for that. Um, Sarah, is there something you wanna fill in on that? Am I giving this topic its due diligence? No, I think that sums it up. Um, and I would just add that if anyone has questions about you know, a member of the public, a member of the committee about particular projects or the CPA in general, I'm, out, I'm always available and happy to talk to people. Uh, Claudia, you wanna sp respond to that? Right. I appreciate your response, especially in, in view of that you are reading the proposals and it's a discussion about proposals. The question that came up for me last week had to do with the um, habitat housing and how many houses are being built. I don't think it's Ryan Road, but it's out in that area so that the habitat houses seem to be being built out of town and the, that the city is making this big push to put housing in town. And I had a question of how how you kind of, that was what came up. It's not, you know, it's, it's something that comes up in the discussion. So I get it that when you're uh, discussing proposals, I won't come back to comment, but just in general, I'm asking about your meetings that it would be open. And it was that question particularly about you know why is habitat be developing outside the town but but we're encouraging inside town development so but so thanks for taking my response i'll be quiet now and let you get on with your business thank you any other public comments okay moving right along um we have minutes of april the 20th of this this last april 2022 to approve uh, Sarah sent those out uh, yesterday, I believe. Uh, is there a motion to approve minutes of April the, the 20th? Uh, yeah, thank moved. you. That was Julia. Is there a second? I'll second it. Thank you, Martha. Any discussion? 
uh, Sarah. All right, so roll call yeah. vote. Jeff? Yes. Jonah? Yes. Chris? Yes. Julia? Yes. Bev? Yes. Martha? Yes. Jen? Yes. And Brian? Yes. All right, unanimous, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. A chair's report, just a few things. One, I had the opportunity to go on uh, a couple Saturdays ago, October 22nd, to Laurel Park's 150th anniversary celebration. And I only caught uh, the tail end of the speakers. Um, but what I did was able to look at at least a couple of the, of the signs that were funded by CPC and put up. And they're really well done. So I encourage people to go to Laurel Park and take a look at it. It's such a an, an interesting community. And I think these, I wanna say seven, Sarah, is that right? Seven signs, nine, seven, seven signs that are out there are, are really uh, quite interesting. And it's a, it's a uh, interesting uh, way to celebrate a unique part of Northampton. So uh, encouraging people to go and look at our good work and helping to, helping to fund those signs. Uh, this Saturday from two to four, there's an opportunity to help move the Shepherd Barn. We've done a lot of funding of the Shepherd Barn. And they're going to, I don't understand it at all, but they're going to put it on something on, you know, rollers and roll it an inch a, a minute or something to move it out so they can redo the foundation, something like that. But anyway, that's two o'clock to four o'clock. Participate in the rolling of Shepherd Barn at historic Northampton. Uh, and uh, Sarah was able to sign one of the pegs, the many pegs she signed for all of us at the Community Preservation Committee because we've been so active in funding the Shepherd Barn. And Sarah hammered the peg in to the barn itself. So we are part of the barn building. Thank you, Sarah. She said it was a lot of work for the one peg. And uh, it'll be curious to see how they, how they, how they move that. The permit to demolish uh, St. John Canius Church was uh, was pulled by O'Connell just this last week, I believe. Is that right, Sarah? Uh, so we will watch and see how they proceed with uh, with moving forward with that uh, with that housing project. Sarah, any news on that? Anything else to add? Uh, just that the uh, the the permit request was withdrawn. At Central Business Architecture Committee last night. Great. Okay, and that's it. That's it for my report. Um, the bulk of this meeting is really turned over to uh, Carolyn Mish, our city planner, and she has one, two, three, four, five, six. Count them. Six proposals in front of us. Three have to do with affordable housing. One is open space acquisition, and then uh, the conservation fund, and then the uh, Rocky Hill multi-use trail and we Sarah put put all six down in uh uh but I think Carolyn's going to to do them in a different order than what we have on our agenda because I think you have a PowerPoint presentation for them that 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 works. So I think what makes sense uh, Carolyn uh is for at the end of each project for us to ask questions have that opportunity rather than going through all six. Um, so if we can do, if we can do that. And again, Carolyn, for you to know, we've had a chance to read the proposals. We asked you a bunch of questions on them, which you responded, thank you. And we've had a chance to look at those answers as well, but it's always good to, uh, to get a refresher course of what those projects are. Uh, sure. And again, for you to know that two weeks from now, November the 16th on our Wednesday meeting is all just public comment on those. So if you know people or want to put out on your social media sites or however you do it, anyone who wants to speak to any of those six city uh, proposals, that's the time to do it. So Carolyn, you are up. Well, thank you. It's um... A pleasure to be here, and um, we always enjoy, um, you know, uh, 
thinking about projects and getting the support from the CPC for these. So the ones that are on the agenda, as you said, if I could just um, share my screen, I'll start um, from the beginning. Um, and um, so we actually sort of cover, um, these proposals cover affordable housing, land conservation, recreation, and non-motorized transportation systems, essentially. Um, so first I wanna talk about, so if we jump into affordable housing, um, and this is um, a request for $50,000 for the affordable housing. So what we've established over, over a couple of years is a fund that's available so that the um, city can take more expedited um, um, procedures um, to move ahead, uh, uh, towards acquiring or developing projects for the purposes of providing affordable housing lots or, or units. And so we, we um, just sort of as a ratio of, of the cost of a total project, this, this um, pool of money amounts to about 9% of project expenses. And previous allocations um, have leveraged you know, over a million dollars worth of other grants or um, uh, funding for the development of permanently protected affordable housing throughout the city. And the, these, the source of funds have been used for uh, more soft costs or site prep and development. So environmental site assessments, survey work, site suitability, um, utility design, and all of this preliminary work on various sites uh, help to relieve some of the burden from the perspective of affordable housing developers. So whether it's a big um, nonprofit like Valley CDC that's doing 20 um, or more units on a property or a smaller um, entity like Habitat who's only doing single family homes and sometimes two or three family, three units. Um, but just to sort of um, clear out some of the um, some of the barriers that they that those applicants might have in approaching a piece of property, and I just have some pictures of examples of the way this money's been used previously. So that we've done survey work. So the upper right corner is an example of um, the survey that was finally created to divide the lots on Burt's Pit Road. Habitat's about to undertake construction very shortly for those three detached single family homes. Um, the picture, the photo below shows what was there before when the um, state hospital uh, um, had structures on the property and actually they weren't demolished that long ago um, by the city, but this is the kind of work that the city can undertake in terms of prepping um, the property. So undertaking demolition activities and identifying wetlands on the property so that every um, so that all the knowns are put out on the table. Um, the bottom um, example is the, um, which is pretty small there, sorry about that, but um, represents the plans for the sidewalk that was just installed in preparation um, as infrastructure work in preparation for Valley CDC to develop the 23 Laurel Street property. So this is all money that uh, sometimes the public isn't even aware of that, that goes to help support affordable housing because sometimes these applicants also come forward later to ask for the actual funding of cons the construction of the housing. Um, so when we think about all the money that's gone to uh, the, how the city supports affordable housing, it's, it's funding from CPA, but it's also the, you know, the soft cost work and the work that is, goes into it ahead of time. Um, and all of these properties do have affordability restrictions that are placed on them when the city sells these parcels so that it's guaranteed that they are um, uh, going to be permanently protected as affordable housing. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, questions from the committee for Carolyn? I'm, I'm not getting every, I'm not seeing everyone, but I'm not seeing any hands. 
on this. I'll ask one, do you see projects coming up uh, that would necessitate use of this fund in the next, uh, or the, 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 uh, the rest of the fiscal year? Yes. Um, um, so we have, um, there are several properties around the city that have our surplus that we are looking at um, different uses of this money. So there's um, the Cook, uh, 196 Cook Avenue, which is the um, old former Moose Lodge is um, on its last days. It will be demolished shortly, but there's still a lot of work that um, needs to be done for that property. So there's opportunities there to um, look at um, infrastructure or in the very least doing survey work to um, identify and help support any infrastructure changes that might be needed. That includes access, uh, pedestrian access through uh, potentially extending sidewalks down to Hatfield. Um, so there's a lot of preliminary work that needs to be done related to that. Um, uh, site design. We, we may have other um, grant money that we can apply to that project in particular, but this would certainly um, help support that. Um, there are, uh, we also have a property in Florence on Oak Street that um, has quite a bit of, that has some work that's already been done. So we've done survey work at that property, but um, there are additional um, actions that need to be taken there to get those um, properties ready. So those are two that, um, come to mind, um, there may be properties that come up in the coming um, fiscal year that um, seem appropriate to evaluate for affordable housing development. Um, and at that point, we, we would um, do some preliminary review, maybe some um, survey work or site assessment that this, to which this funding could um, support. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's very helpful. Um, hi, Carolyn. Bev Bates, I'm new to this group. Um, I'm curious, is there a fund that um, developers can draw on for pre-development expenses? Anywhere in the whole city structure? Um, no. I mean, what typically happens is the applicants would either approach um, you all in a funding round to ask for that. Right. Um, this is for a property that the city um, owns or that, or if the city um, intends to um, negotiate some kind of purchase. Um, so yes. the city doesn't have a fund um, that says- would, would you think that would be useful? Um, I mean, I know there I are state resources that nonprofits can go to for pre-dev. Uh, some have their yeah. own resources. I'm just curious as to whether or not um, you think it would be productive to think about uh, some kind of developer-specific fund that maybe you guys would administer, but um, might come from CPA funding among other places. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I would say, and it would certainly probably be good discussion for the group, but I think that kind of, um, that kind of situation um, provides a good opportunity for individuals to ask CBC directly, and then yep. the, you all as a committee can evaluate you know, the agency, what they're interested in, how they're interested in using the money specifically on a piece of property. Whereas if we do that internally, then we have to set up a whole sort of administrative yep. review, um, you know, entity that would do that. And we don't have the same kind of, um, you know, as it's not a committee, it's an administrative evaluation determining which player is valid and which is not. And that's probably better suited to the committee, I would say. Yeah, that makes that makes sense to me. It's just that sometimes, you know, it's hard to make a case for something until you have enough of the facts behind you to uh, make the case. 
So yeah, uh, I yeah. mean, I will say the bigger the bigger entities, you know, Wayfinders and TCB and Valley have a pretty robust system in place to do that, and they can get those funds. Um, we do support them when we have properties, obviously, that we want to pitch to them to say, hey, we think this is a good property. And so it's sort of as though we need to be the ones to prove to them that, that it's good and it will be, you know, and uh, a relatively smooth process for them to get through the permitting. And so that's why this fund is really good for us yeah. um, to have. I get I get that. Thank you very much for explaining. Jeff, yeah. um, Carolyn, um, not to not to fast forward, but can you expand a little bit on what's the difference between this proposal and the one you have for Leeds, which is essentially looking at um, other than the price tag, which there there's one difference there, but um, because it seems yeah. to be site assessment in, in both cases and why the need to separate one from the other? Sure. Um, so they, the um, difference is that we've already done a little bit of work in Leeds, and I don't know if you want me to go ahead and talk no. about that one in detail, but um, we know that there are some very specific things and we kind of know what the cost is to further that, um, um, illuminate the issues that are on the property. I mean, one of the, and this came up um, uh, in public comment about um, the concern that maybe Habitat's not so interested in this property anymore. One of the biggest issue is because the, the preliminary um, assessment that was done on the property um, didn't allay the concerns for Habitat enough um, because of the previous use on the property, which there was a water tank there and water lines, and I can um, show you that on the next slide. But that's sort of the deeper dive that's specific to this property. And we don't necessarily have all of those issues in um, when we're just starting out on some other parcels. So that's the difference. Okay, thank you. Other questions for Carolyn? Um, I will ask one more, and that is, do you see in the next round any big housing projects coming to us, to your knowledge? Um, so for the spring? Yeah. Um, I... Um, I don't think so because I think the only other project, I think Valley CDC has received funding, correct, for both Laurel and Bridge Road from you all. Um, maybe Sarah, you can confirm that. Um, um, not for Laurel Street. Um, oh, Laurel, right. They did for Bridge. So Laurel Street may be the, um, the next funding um, round. I, that, 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 that's right. They, um, they just finished permitting for 23 Laurel Street, which is um, represented in that survey um, of the street there on the lower part of this. So yes, um, I know that they're actually going to DHCB um, in January for their um, application, their one-stop application for both those projects, Bridge Road and Laurel. So I would imagine they would um, then come circle back um, to you all for Laurel. Great, it's nice, it's nice to have a heads up about that. Any other questions for Carolyn about the Affordable Housing Fund? Okay, seems like we're good to go on that. Um, moving on to the, whatever your next one is, Carolyn. Um, so this one is the down, what we're calling the Downtown Affordable Housing Project. $60,000 ask, I don't know, oops, sorry, I don't know how um, familiar you are with this um, project and the status, but the city received a 
uh, municipal um, vulnerability preparedness grant from the state to, um, it's a two year grant, um, just under a million dollars to design this site. Um, and um, it's for the purposes of building 20 to 24 units of affordable housing, including um, people just coming from homelessness. Um, would That's the goal is to design for that sort of the most vulnerable population. The request for $60,000 is um, four and a half percent, just over four and a half percent of the budget. It provides the match that so we actually um, um, wrote a budget for the grant indicating that um, we would seek um, $60,000 as um, for the first year match from CBC. We also have to have a match in the second year. It's a much bigger match in the second year, but we anticipate that that match will come from the value of the property. So we're going to have the property appraised and um, be um, giving that to the ultimate um, buyer of the property. And so that donation counts as a contribution and will make our match for year two. So this is year one of the grant request. Um, and it's to help in that design um, process for the building. And in the application, of course, there are many other um, sort of details about the site and sort of um, the massing studies that have already been done for this site. But um, it's, um, it, it's a complex um, site and a complex project. And we're really happy that we were able to get that grant to um, help us put that further, um, put the design out there so that um, the successful bidder um, for the prop property already sort of has that piece of the equation um, addressed. Uh, I will also say that we put the RFP for the property um, out there. It's um, it just went, hit the streets, I think a week ago, maybe two weeks ago. So that is in process now. Thank you, Carolyn. Questions for Carolyn? I'll go. No, I'll go. Um, thanks, Carolyn. Um, so looking at this proposal, I, I guess I guess I what I, the, the short question is, how far into it are we? Um, because as you alluded to, it seems to me to be a fairly complicated uh, um, way forward. Um, and, uh, you know, I just don't really understand the process all that well. I guess I, I want to know uh, sort of where the milestones are as far as to, you know, um, how committed uh, you said the RFP went out. Um, at what points are we going to see some sort of review about the practicality of this? Are we committed to doing something on this spot or is that still to be decided based on the work that's going to be done over the next year or so. Um, so before we applied for the grant, we hired Jones Witsit Architects to look at the feasibility of building on this site. Um, we've also done um, borings um, that were um, supported with, actually we did a lot of this preliminary work with the affordable housing fund that we were just talking about previously in the in our first um, request that I went over. Um, and so we found um, we've had a lot of background information to let us know that it is a feasible building site. And we put all of that into our application to the state for our um, MVP grant. And so um, I don't, so the question isn't really the feasibility of it. We're moving, the Jones Whitson Architects is moving forward on a design with all of those um, factors in place, you know, with the understanding the soils and how a building, you know, what kind of building needs to be built here is going to be built to the passive house standard that's required by the state. Um, and so it, and the city has um, surplus the property for affordable housing. We've surveyed it um, and we've issued the RFP. So I think in terms of milestones, we have milestones for the grant itself, for the MVP grant. 
um, and we have to reach um, the sort of initial designs by the end of the fiscal year and then moving into the next fiscal year is going to be the majority sort of the detailed design um, elements, but we will have the successful, um, the, the applicant who is interested in, in moving forward with this, whether it's, um, you know, TCB or Wayfinders or Valley, um, they will be part of that design process and undertaking and, and having input into that. So um, from, you know, we're, um, this is a viable site for, for housing. Uh, Chris, right, thanks. Any, any follow up questions? Um, probably, but not right now. <laughs> Martha, uh, Martha. I keep on. Um, I just have a couple questions about um, the timeline. So the you've issued the RFP. It's out to out right now. Um, when do you expect to receive responses to that? I think the deadline, I'm getting my dates mixed up. I think it's mid-November. Um, okay, so we might know by the time of the next meeting who, I'm sure you have to go through a review, review process, but we'll know yeah. whether you've received interested, um, bid, interested bids, I guess, on it. Yeah, I think okay. so, yeah. And and you'll, we'll know where you whether you have, um, you know, viable bidders who are um, capable of doing this. And then I'm assuming that um, if all goes as planned, uh, the um, developer will be putting together the package of funding for this to construct, correct? Correct, right. Um, but would you be coming back to us for, would they be coming back to us for money to do that? Likely? It's possible, yeah. Okay. Um, and then finally, um, has there been any uh, community engagement around this project? Just curious about that, you know, um, because it's in the middle of the city and there's so many businesses around it. Um, I just wondered if an, there'd been any um, involvement with those folks in the general public, just so they're aware of what's going on and what the city's thinking. Yeah, not yet. Um, that's definitely in the scope for um, the, I think it's spring, certainly through next, um, starting the next fiscal year. Um, um, that's, that's already, that's in the works. Thank you. Other questions for Carolyn? Um, I have one, Carolyn, this would be the site of the Resiliency Center, is that correct? No, that's going to be a separate, that's um, in a separate building. So even, so we have been looking at the Roundhouse building, which is on the other side of the municipal building for the hub, we had an option with the property owner that has since expired. Um, so we're still looking for a space for the resilience hub. But we want to make it close enough so that there is some connectivity, so that people who might need services um, or want to avail themselves of services at the hub can do so in an, you know, an accessible way. So there's no plans on turning a portion of this into that center? No, no, this is all housing. Okay, I don't know where I get that idea. Any there other questions? Been, um, I'm sorry, sorry go I was just gonna clarify. There had been at, um, early on, there had been a discussion about whether if we couldn't find a place for the hub, should we use this parcel as a place to have a hub and then maybe some other uses. But that, um, that, has been um, removed from the equation for a couple of months now. Okay, thank you. Any other questions for Carolyn or on the uh, downtown 
affordable housing proposal. Okay. In the absence of further questions, Carolyn, moving on. Okay. So the next one is the Leeds housing. So we touched on this a little bit previously. Um, $25,000 ask. Um, again, this would be soft costs. And to differentiate, there's still, so, so what happened, so when we did some initial survey work and an environmental site assessment on this property um, and had approached Habitat, um, there were some interested um, members of Habitat uh, uh, regarding this property and they thought it would be great for single family home, but the board um, voted against it because they were concerned about what might still be underground that they would encounter when they went to do construction. And so I have a picture here of a survey showing the circles of um, um, the old wells that were taken off of the site, the water tanks, I'm sorry. Um, the last one was taken out uh, about 24 or 25 years ago. But you can see here that there are sort of mapped um, lines, um, so buried water lines on the property. And there's no clear understanding of what happened to those lines if those were also removed at the time um, the tanks, uh, the water um, towers were taken out. And so the next thing to do would be to do borings. Um, and uh, determine if those pipes are there and figure out a solution um, if they are there. And then if we can eliminate that, that might, might bring habitat back to the table, but that was their main concern. So we really, so this um, request is for um, engineering oversight, um, design, a potentially design of, this, of the lot and also borings to really, um, um, clarify exactly what's on the site. This property is just slightly under the minimum lot size of um, allowed for uh, single family homes or two family homes in um, the, this neighborhood. So it's the urban residential A district. So um, literally it's a hundred square feet smaller than what the minimum um, required lot size is by zoning. So any housing that would go here would need to have at least 50% of the units be affordable. But again, the minimum lot size in the urban residential aid district allows for single and two family homes um, um, in this neighborhood. But we don't know, you know what the outcome will be based on, you know, uh, the findings. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, questions for Carolyn about the Leeds project? We had in public comment a person speaking about the Leeds Civic Association, I believe. I can't remember. Uh, but have you done community engagement with this? And what were the feelings of local folk? So early, so previously when we were looking at it, I think that's what um, Pennington had referred to is that there was, um, a, um, Wayne Fiden did meet um, with the community to talk about this property. And at the time um, it seemed that it would be a good match for Habitat. And so that's where those comments come from because there had been public outreach um, about this site. We haven't done um, anything since then um, because this sort of got put on the back burner. We didn't have any more resources to address some of the concerns raised by Habitat. So we haven't um, had a reason to um, conduct any more public outreach. And, um, we probably wouldn't do that until after we understand more what's on the property and who the, what kind of um, project this might result in based on those findings. And how do you deal with the fact that it exceeds or it, it uh, is less than the minimum uh, space requirement? 
Yeah, we've known this all along and the survey confirmed it. Um, but there is a provision in the ordinance that allows for the planning board, essentially it's a local, what we refer to as a local 40B process where the planning board can waive the zoning if 50% of the units um, minimally are um, deed restricted for affordable housing. So, so the only way this could have a house on it is if, um, if it's one house, if that one is deed restricted, so if it's a habitat type of house, or if there are two units, then at least one of them has to be deed restricted um, for affordable housing. Thank you. Chris? Yeah, I actually just sort of want to, it's a comment, not a question, but it's to circle back to something that uh, Jeff raised earlier. I, I just wanted to let you know that I, I appreciate the fact that um, although this would be the kind of thing that you cover under the, uh, the, the, um, the, 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 you know, the fund that, that we're looking at, um, that you came and asked for it separately. Um, I'm just not a huge fan of allocating um, undesignated funds. So anytime you can, even if it is for the soft cost kind of work, uh, if you can come up with a, with a, with a, you know, an individual proposal, that's, that's always going to be my preference. So I, I do appreciate that. Thank you, Chris. Any other questions for Carolyn? On this one. So I think that ends our three city proposals for affordable housing. And now you're gonna move on to conservation stuff, open space. Right, right. So, um... The next um, um, request is $50,000 to support the conservation fund. A, a very similar sort of um, idea, which is to um, be able to act more quickly um, for land acquisitions, you know, do some investigations of property um, before determinations are made. So it allows, um, um, both for um, parcels that are important for agriculture or conservation, um, allows us to move forward on necessary steps um, to take to understand what the property is, if it's something that the city might be interested in pursuing further. So covers appraisals, survey work, 21 E's, um, and you, um, this is part of the application, but just to reiterate, um, uh, and this is, speaks um, a bit to Chris's comment that anything for, you know, acquisition of property that's over $10,000 that we would come back um, to CPC, even though the committee has allowed a, um, a little bit of a higher threshold for that. Um, but um, these are all... Um, so, so this pot of money wouldn't be used for anything that's sort of a bigger ask for acquisition. And, and of course, any of the properties that are acquired using this money would have conservation, permanent conservation restrictions. On them. Carolyn, can you refresh my memory? What is a 21E? Um, so it's an initial assessment of a property to see if there's any concern that might be raised about previous uses that might have left um, contamination on the on the site. Um, just gives sort of a broad as a historical look at the property to see if there are any red flags essentially um, about um, things that need to be investigated further for environmental um, contamination concerns. Thank you. Questions for Carolyn? Jeff? Um, I don't know if you can answer this or not, Carolyn, um, but um, are you aware um, of this particular approach um, with these type of funds being done by other um, cities in the Commonwealth 
with regard to the uh, CPC committees that might be in other localities across the state. It's like, I'm just asking, it's like, is this a, a general trend that's happening right now? Um, that's a good question. I don't know for sure. I'd have to check and I'd be happy to sort of look and figure out if, if and how many other communities are doing this. I mean, I think we came, we realized this, um, you know, over the course of ye the years when property owners would come to us and, um, you know, with potential land that they wanted to sell to the city. And we didn't have the ability to um, do really any more detailed investigation to determine whether they're viable properties or what the issues were. And we would have to come to the committee, you know, individually for each property. And that sometimes would result in losing options for properties. And certainly the other piece of it is actually, it becomes public at that point. And sometimes property owners don't want that until they have an option to purchase. And we're not gonna be able to put an option to purchase without knowing some of these things first. And so um, I would imagine that other communities have also come up against that um, sort of chicken and egg situation. Um, but I don't know the numbers and I don't know. Yeah, I'd, I'll add that there are definitely communities that are doing both approaches, the Affordable Housing Fund and the Conservation Fund. I, I can't name them uh, without doing some additional research, but they're definitely out there. Yeah, it would be good to know um, down the road. And yeah, okay. I'm, in it, I'm in it for both funds. So sure. thank you. All right, I, I can come up with that. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think my question echoes um, what Sarah just said. Um, I too, I personally think that conservation and affordable housing can go very much hand in hand. I think that the um, public policy decisions that get made about what to do with land forever um, can complement one another. And I'm just curious as to whether there's, I'm gonna win the award at least for the next six months for asking questions that are all about being the newcomer. So just remember that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's an interesting conversation to have and I would encourage whomever uh, to have it. Um, so that's more speech than question, I guess. Well, I mean, I can answer the question, uh, question Please. that I think I heard yeah. in there. Um, with examples of what the city has done, and we call them limited development projects, but uh -huh. um, the city has undertaken um, several of these. So off of Glendale Road, there was a property that was going to be a subdivision, and the city worked with the property owner to um, permanently protect um, the really the rich um, ecological resources on the property, but carve off affordable housing lots at the front end all right on Glendale Road. And those are now three habitat lots. We yep. also have done that on Burt's Pit Road. Um, right, I, I live right near there. So yes, thank you yeah. for reminding me. Yep. Yeah. And so there are maybe five or six other projects of similar type around the city where we've done both of those um, things together. Thank you for the education. Yeah. I, and I will just add, the biggest one is probably the state hospital redevelopment. So, yeah. and I do know about that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Julia? Yeah, I mean, I just wanna comment that I really appreciate seeing the, um, the hard cost approval threshold going back to 10,000. And the table that you included that provided us with some accounting for all of the different types of costs, I found very helpful. So, um, it, it, I'm, I'm I've been on the committee long enough to know that in some years' time you'll be back again looking for more money for this fund and potentially we we've seen it it it, it just keeps coming around and um, it would be great for us to see an ongoing accounting of the use of these monies if we continue to provide uh, public funds for it. 
Absolutely. Thanks. Other questions? Um, the fund as it stands right now is at zero. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, great. Okay, if there are no other questions, moving right along. Okay. So this is the the big one for today. <laughs> um, this is a Sawmill Hills core property. Um, it's um, the otherwise known or known by the owner's name as a Hamare parcel or parcels. And um, the map I'm showing here is is um, a zoom out of, of the region going all the way down to New Jersey. And this is from the Nature Conservancy. And I just sort of want to put, because in the application, there's lots of information about the um, rich um, um, habitat and ecological resources uh, in this one particular property and how it's a gap between our Sawmill Hills holdings. But I also wanted to put it in the context of the greater United States. Um, and this green area, this sort of sprinkled green and blue areas have been mapped by the Nature Conservancy um, that where they've looked at sort of swaths of areas that are important for um, climate resilience, um, climate resiliency, habitat, and sort of armoring um, the human populations against the effects of climate change. And so the red arrow there represents sort of about where this Pomeroy property is. So it's within the green blotches. So there's a portion of Western, the Western part of Northampton and includes the sawmill and the Mineral Hills areas that are really important and have this rich diverse uh, biodiversity um, and are considered to be high levels of areas where there can be um, movement, habitat movement, um, um, ecological um, sort of transition areas and, and um, strength um, for fortifying against um, the effects of climate change. So it's important to sort of think about this, even though it's this 229 piece uh, acre property, it connects and means that it's going to per be permanently protected with the other land holdings that the city already has. Um, so, um, and it's a beautiful piece of property, um, 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 obviously, because of those reasons. So that's, um, and this, I'm sorry, also matches the grant that I, um, I, Sarah must have announced previously that she was successful in obtaining this land grant for um, this property. So combined, it's really um, becomes, um, it, it allows us to purchase this property. And the, so the ask is 37% approximately of the total. Congratulations on that land grant, which was what, 400,000? That's that's very exciting. Uh, questions for the Solomon Hills acquisition from Carolyn? Um, forgive my memory lapse. Is this the one where you're waiting on the Kestrel grant as well? Um, I I think it's just these two. Is that right, Sarah? Yeah, so Kestrel was looking at a foundation grant. They haven't heard back about that yet. Um, but even if it is successful, it wouldn't be anywhere near approaching the amount of the land grant. So it, it might reduce the ask slightly, but probably not significantly. Okay. And, and the answers to the questions indicated you don't know when the Kestrel Foundation grant will come in. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Uh, but theoretically, by the end of the year, we would know if the ask was to be shaved or perhaps a little bit. Yeah, and e even if it if the award came in afterwards, um, if the committee were to recommend funding for the full project amount, anything unspent would be returned to the CPA project fund. Right, thanks. It's very exciting. We have such a great track record with those land grants. It's amazing how much money we've been able to pull in. Uh, other questions for Carolyn? 
Jonah? Yeah, Carolyn, is this the parse? Does this parcel include that so called Jeep Eater Trail that leads up to those clearings at the top of the hill? And, and, and if so, is that I assume that the uh, there'd have to be all kinds of mitigation for all the erosion and stuff that's happened there, but it may not be part of this parcel at all. So the Jeep Eater parcel is already owned by and protected by the city. This, you may be, you know, there was some logging done on this. So I don't know if you're thinking about um, uh, concerns of tracking that you saw on the property, but the property owner, so Pomeroy's, um, took out a logging permit. And so that, um, that is complete, but, you know, they did that. We knew they were doing that as of course it's their, their right as the property owner to do that. But, um, and obviously once the city owns it, um, then, you know, we would be doing that. Um, and there, and there's already been some sort of evaluation of the property to understand sort of where we might, um, you know, network trails and things and, and address anything that's sort of remnant to that work that was done on the property. Deep Eater Trail, there's a, there's a name for it. Um, any other questions for Carolyn about this project? Okay, last but not least, we've got the Rocky Hill multi-use trail. Well, actually, I, I counted seven, and I have two in here. So I have the Connecticut River Greenway um, um, first, and then I'll do the Rocky Hill. Yeah, okay. Um, so this is... Um, this this is um, a connector from, um, and this is a photo taken from the, this is in your application as well, but there's already a beaten path in this area between the, um, where the Damon Road, Connecticut River Greenway and Boat Launch area is now. This would be a trail that connect, that sort of winds around the Connecticut River and hopefully connects to um, Hatfield we're still having conversations with the town of Hatfield. Um, they're not so sure they want to bike a multi-use path um, coming <laughs> um, to the town. So if that's, um, so I, I say that because um, either way, the city is very interested in moving forward. It's a beautiful location and there's um, along the river. And, and so, um, where we are now is in this sort of 10% design phase. Mass DOT has allowed, has provided a project review for this as sort of the initial step to putting it on the, the TIP, um, the Massachusetts Transportation Improvement um, Program. Um, if that happens, they, so the Mass DOT will only put it um, on the tip if it's going to be a multi-use trail all the way to Hatfield. At the moment, we don't know that, but we have a mass trails grant just to look at the Northampton side and evaluate and make and do some preliminary design work. So up to about the 10% design threshold, which this ask is to help support because we also have a matching requirement for this mass trails grant. Um, the hope is that we get to do a little bit beyond the 10% um, threshold. And if Hatfield says, yes, they're willing to connect to all the wonderful multi-use trails in Massachusetts by um, having a little um, link up from um, the Mass Central Trail, then that means Mass DOT will pay for the entire construction of the project. Um, and we just need the cities responsible for designing it and all the design costs that go into that up to the point of um, project construction. At that point, DOT takes over. So um, that's just sort of background information. And then just to say that even if, you know, we get the match for this Mass Trails grant, we conduct all this survey work and, and evaluation of the trail and Hatfield says, no, never mind. We don't want to be part of the Massachusetts uh, multi-use trail network, and we don't want to connect to, to Northampton. 
we still think it's a valuable trail to add along the Connecticut River. It's a beautiful piece of, um, of um, Northampton that's inaccessible right now to, to anybody because it's sandwiched between the river and the railroad and I-91. Um, so even if it were just a trail to an overlook across the Connecticut and over to um, Hadley Fields, it would still be an amazing recreational um, and conservation land. So even if, so, uh, um, you know, a long way of saying that the $40,000, if we're successful and if the, if the committee agrees that this is uh, a project worth funding, um, that it wouldn't go to waste even if, if Hatfield says they don't want to participate. Thank you. Questions about this? Martha? Yes. Um, Carolyn, uh, when you when you say Hatfield um, is deciding, I guess um, is that uh, you know the town administrators? Is it their open space committee? <clears throat> um, and I guess maybe a more direct way of saying this is the link dependent on access through town owned lands, or is it dependent on access through private owned lands where easements would be required or, you know, presumably, you know, purchases or takings? Um, so the town of Hatfield owns land um, right at the end where it crosses into um, the town of Hatfield. There's a split parcel right before the Northampton Hatfield line where the city owns half the rights and there's a private property that owns the other. So we would have to um, negotiate that, but um, it's primarily the select board that would make the decision. It's not the open space committee. Um, and they've already had sort of one public forum about it that you may have read about in the paper, um, in the Gazette, I should say, but um, the, um, so there the select board is a, is sort of trying to read the tea leaves and understand what the support is in the community for this. They've asked about parking on Elm Court, which is where it would come out. And so our designers are putting together a preliminary layout of what a parking, a small parking lot on the Hatfields DP. So Hatfields Department of Public Works owns a piece of property right there where it comes out. And um, we're looking at designing a parking lot to accommodate the concerns about where people would park to access the trail in the hat on the Hatfield side. So is the initial and maybe you don't have a sense of this, the initial reading on this that there is like a split opinion about it? Is it favoring joining joining on or is it, you know, adamantly no? Any sense of that? I definitely would say it's not adamantly no, but I do Good. think it's split. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Julia? So, um, I am trying to just connect a bunch of different projects on the Connecticut River Greenway that we've looked at over the years. And, and I'm trying to connect this in also with a plan that we looked at related to swimming areas and where this all fits in and how we're going to manage that entire Greenway area. So this is nice and this looks small. How does it connect to some of the other pieces we've worked on and funded? How does it connect to the plans for swimming or not swimming there, which I know were somewhat controversial. Where does all that play out? Yeah. Um, so um, I'm just hesitating because I'm trying to decide whether I should risk stopping the screen share and putting up another map <laughs> um, or just sort of talk through it. And if you need a map, I'd be happy to provide it with um, to you. Um, so there have been, um, you know, um, funds that you guys have allocated for the Connecticut River Greenway are, um, have been good, put to 
good use and are definitely um, appreciated. And the idea is that we're sort of trying to tie all of these things together. So we have this Connecticut Greenway Park where the boat house itself is located. Um, then there's the conservation area that's along the river where the boats actually launch. That's conservation area versus city of Northampton Parks Department. Um, and the latest is that we've done some um, uh, added, uh, there've been, there's been funding for new um, docks and accessible access to the beach area. And of course this summer, there was lots of beach use because there was this brand new beach that washed up on shore um, from some storms a couple of years ago. And um, we had done two, 2021, we had done a feasibility assessment about swimming areas around the city. So six places to look at potential feasibility. Um, we hadn't focused too much on this area, the Connecticut River um, Greenway. However, um, there's been interest after this past summer, um, there's been interest from um, the Parks Department and the Mayor's Office to look more in depth about the feasibility of doing a, a, a public, creating a public swimming area here, at, I mean, at that park. So what that would mean is, um, you know, connecting, pulling all these resources together, say ultimately in the grant, you know, if everything, if the stars aligned, you know, we'd have this, um, we already have the parking lot that's at the boathouse. Um, we have, thanks Sarah. <laughs> um, so you see the white um, box here, which is the boat house in the middle of the parking lot. So there's parking here and then there's access down to the river with a boat launch. And that's where the swimming area would be. What we're talking about is Greenway um, actually comes um, sort of, do you, in, on the Google Earth picture, there's this white line here, which is the driveway. So where Sarah's moving her arrow, is moving along the railroad track as the Connecticut River Greenway. And it keeps going north, um, essentially um, pretty close to the railroad. Um, there are parts that veer closer to the river um, as the railroad moves away from the river, but along this whole stretch of the Connecticut and then up to Elm Court in Hatfield is where that would go. So, um, there are already this green, that other green space is already um, city um, conservation area that was purchased years ago. Um, and you can see a little where it says Hatfield Road or Elm Court, there's a little clearing there. And that, that um, is the Department of the Hatfield Department of Public Works um, sort of um, um, a staging area for lack of better term. But that's where it would come out. Thanks, Sarah. So parking would be available at the old railroad bridge as well as at the boat ramp. Is that correct? To access right, this? But the majority being at the boat ramp because it's really like a four or five space parking. But right now, I don't believe there's any prohibition about parking on Elm Court. It's a very wide street. So it's a public street. So there's uh, potential for public parking along that street too, but certainly the the big parking lot is at the Connecticut River uh, Greenway. Thank you, Carolyn. Other questions for Carolyn? Okay, I think now, oh, Jonah. Hey Carolyn, um, the uh, what I, I maybe everybody else already knows this, but what improvements are planned for this bikeway along the road there that leads to the gate into the I don't know the but where the boathouse is. I know that I know that the there's the two lane bike path being built along Damon Road, and I know there's probably a crosswalk. I don't know if there's going to be a light there. At, at what is, I don't remember the name of that road that goes past the the big housing project. But um, well, 
Yeah. But it's then actually a that road is going to be a carved bike path or a delineated bike path on that road. Is that currently in the works already? So that is a, it's a private driveway. It's called, I think, Lane Plant Road, <laughs> but it's really a driveway and it's owned by River Run for the most part. Right. Um, they have not wanted to, so um, there are, so the short answer is there are no um, planned improvements for that road. When the, when the office park was approved by the planning board, there was a lot of discussion about potential sidewalk, but along that driveway, but River Run um, Association was, was not interested in having a sidewalk built on their property um, with, in that driveway layout. Um, there's not a lot of traffic on that road. I mean, the only traffic really are the people going to River Run. And then on the weekends, of course, um, during the summer there, um, and during the boating season, there's sort of, um, you know, boat users using that. Um, so we don't have a plan for um, any kind of um, striping at the moment. I mean, we would need permission from River Run. Has River Run been informed of this proposed multi-use trail? And what is the feeling of River Run residents about it? Because it is pretty close to their property, correct? Yeah, I mean, it's all on city property um, um, or on easements, I guess, um, for a portion of it. Um, we have not had, I don't believe there's been a discussion about it at this point. We're still sort of in that early design phase. Um, uh, but, you know, we have um, easements along that driveway for the park. So it's in, it's sort of an extension of the park. Hey, Carolyn. Yeah. Uh, so, so is it the intention of this project that, just to clarify, that people will park above the boathouse in that lot that's already there to use it? Um, they could, or they could bike there. Yeah. Other questions for Carolyn? Okay. So last but certainly not least is the Rocky Hill multi-use trail. Um, this is to get us across the finish line for this project. This is um, Rocky Hill um, Greenway connector. So on the right, I have, there's a map here, sort of a zoomed out version with this, um, um, heavy um, black line coming from the rail trail that, um, or the multi-use path, I should say, the New Haven, um, Northampton um, Canal Trail that runs to East Hampton. So just before you get to the bridge overpass across um, Route 10 um, to East Hampton, um, the, there'll be um, a trail that come that connects in and that um, snakes through um, city owned property up to Rocky Hill Road and then um, eventually and, and then carry you over to Ice Pond Drive. And then taking off Ice Pond Drive, there's a trail connector through the woods um, to Florence Road. So this piece will connect um, sort of all those neighborhoods off of Florence Road, at least on the east side of Florence Road, easily down to the bike path um, that connects to East downtown East Hampton and Northampton. Um, what the $60,000 ask is for sort of broken split, essentially um, into two bits. Uh, uh, we need maybe slightly more than 30,000 of that 60,000 to complete the um, designs and go to um, the um, get them to bid state, bid ready um, documents. So DOT has made the final, and, and being a DOT project, this will be the construction itself is gonna be entirely funded by Mass DOT. Um, 
So it's just the city's obligation to um, pay for the design up to the construction point. We also need some money for um, assistance in, in engineering oversight. If there are any questions that come up, if there's some tweaks in the field during construction. So um, that's construction admin that mostly DOT takes care of it, but there are occasionally times when we need an engineer to represent our position with DOT's engineers if there are changes that come up. So um, I just have on this map sort of a zoom in of this, um, this um, serpentine section of the trail. Um, we're really close to finalizing this. It's had its 100% it's design review by DOT and we just need to make changes based on their comments. And so this is sort of the most complicated section of the trail because it weaves between wetland resource areas and um, there's lots of grading. Um, so that's what this ask is for. And I put the schedule up there. Um, that's our anticipated bid date is June, 2023. So all the designs have to be, you know, everything's done before June, 2023. And then construction is about a year and a half. DOT money is there, is that correct? Yes. So all that's and left in the, in the financial piece is, uh, is 60,000. Right. Thank you. Other questions for Carolyn? Everybody good to go on this? Yes. Any other questions at all for Carol? Well, thank you so much for the seven projects that you have presented to us. Uh, and once again, knowing that in two weeks from tonight, on the, what do we say, the 16th of November, will be public comment. It always helps to hear uh, folks weigh in. So if you can put that out and however you can, that would that would be great. Uh, sure. And Carolyn, I don't know if you're able to stick around just for this last agenda item, which is to look at uh, outreach. That might be helpful, uh, helpful sure. for you to, uh, to to be doing that as well. Um, I will stick around. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Uh, so moving on to our next agenda item, which is CPA outreach. And we periodically address this issue. How can we uh, be more visible to uh, folks? Um, get I any ideas that we have for Carolyn, for Sarah, in terms of pu publicizing the good work that we do, but also what the deadlines are for applicants, what the rules are for applicants, how to access the website, uh, any of that stuff. Um, and I know, Chris, you brought this up a few times. How could we be more proactive in getting the word out? Um, and uh, uh, so if there are, and, and this has come up with uh, public comments as well, people encouraging us to uh, bend over backwards to get, to get the word out. Um, so Sarah, maybe you can tell us what you do currently in terms of publicizing stuff. If there's anything that that you do and if folks have any ideas or any suggestions for Carolyn or Sarah or the city or anybody, the mayor, to get the word out. Sure, so the CPA website is the best resource for applicants to be able to figure out what's going on with the CPA in Northampton, what it is, what it does, what's available, um, provides information about past, past grant recipients, uh, application deadlines, and it's updated regularly. Um, contact information available there as well. Um, I do get calls periodically throughout the year from people inquiring about CPA and applications and whether something they're thinking about might be eligible. Um, as grant rounds are coming up, we typically have done a press release. We have not been successful to get 
um, press outlets to pick that up um, fairly recently. You know, sometimes the Gazette covers um, periodically things that get funded, but the announcement of the rounds themselves tend not to be picked up. Um, we also do an, an email blast to the um, to our listserv, which has a substantial number of recipients. Carolyn, can you add to that, or is that does that summarize um, it? Outreach and just so you all may be on the listservs as well, but the city councilors are in that, and they have their own, you know, um, constituent listserv. So. Um, occasionally I can't think of the last time occasionally I see that on some of the city councilors um, listserv and I think that's a really um, um, valuable resource um, for getting information out I'll also say that internally I think this came up during public comment that um, uh, you know, do we talk to people coming to the office about these funding opportunities? And the answer is yes. So anytime anyone has an application that is um, aligned with um, the objectives of the um, CPA and the um, funding um, allocations that you all um, consider, we absolutely encourage uh, people to look at that as a mechanism for assisting in getting their project completed. Um, so um, that that holds for um, historic preservation, for affordable housing. Um, and there just there are projects that um, you know don't um, align with those um, objectives and and um, project areas. Um, and so uh, we certainly don't encourage people to bark up the wrong tree um, when that's the case. I like the idea of getting, making sure the city councilors can put it out on their uh, sites um, in their blasts. I think that, that, that would be helpful. Uh, ideas for Sarah and Carolyn in terms of how to publicize these deadlines and the ability of of uh, applicants to understand what the requirements are and anything else that we can think of to add to that? I had a quick question, which might help inform my thinking. Is it okay to ask? Please. Um, just curious, Sarah, where the your listserv comes from? Like who is on that and how do people get added to it? So it, it's a sort of a, a combination of several different listservs that the Planning Department and Community Preservation Committee have had over the years. We used to have a separate CPA listserv, but we realized it was a lot of duplication between that and the Planning Department listserv. So we combined them to be able to reach more people. Um, currently, you can sign up for it. I'm just like, make sure I'm saying the right thing. On the Planning Department homepage, um, so you can sign up for newsletter and board agendas there, and then also sign up for our email newsletter. Um, and Karen, do you have a, a rough number of how many people that goes to? And it's a couple uh, of thousand. Yes, I haven't looked at the number recently. Um, we also, uh, many times when we do public forums and people want to know um, how they can um, stay in touch with things that are happening. That's another avenue where we, where more people tend to join the listserv, you know, after we do public outreach. So we just had, um, you know, for whatever it is, if it's downtown Florence or the historic preservation planning process, um, you know, sometimes um, typically people join up after they've also participated in one of those events. Does Historic Commission and Conservation Commission have their own list, sir? No, so they're all combined. They're all combined. Uh, Jen, you have another question or comment? Yeah, just a simple idea is that um, 
I didn't know about the listserv and I've been on this committee for a while. Like we could just mention it in each of our meetings. I know that most people are not combing through our meeting notes or attending meetings, but when we make decisions that catch people's attention, just highlighting that there is this sort of ongoing source of information, like as part of an intro or outro might be a helpful, like, I think the, I, appreciate that there is this website with everything on it. I think if somebody's not knowing to look for it, like I understand that feeling of kind of like, what is this and where did it come from? Um, so just that there's another pro like way that they don't have to be proactively finding our notes on the website, but that they can get an email about important news. Great. Okay. Yeah, I'm going to go there again. And it feels like 830 is not the time to have a robust discussion about citizen participation. But, um, you know, the I'm 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 coming to understand that there are a whole bunch of different venues in which people's um, uh, input into public priorities is gleaned. Um, and I, and I get that. I'm curious as to how those then are synthesized into what the priorities for CPA funding, let's talk about that, um, should be within obviously the construct of what uh, CPA funds can be used for. And is that transparent to people? Because I think that people are way more luck happy to participate if they understand what the the thing is in which they are being asked to participate. So that's question number one. Question number two is probably easy, but more complex. And that is, when do you see a return to some uh, public, meaning not Zoom uh, in interaction? Because I think that is a, for some people, this is a way easier way to do it. You can go home from work and get on, on the computer, but I don't think it says, robust a way to communicate about stuff as the good old fashioned public meeting. Uh, so I'll, I'll take a stab at this. So for, for the second point of that, I will defer to the committee. Um, you know, every Northampton public board is making their own decisions about when and whether to return to um, in-person yeah. meetings. And every committee is different, you know, some, some, uh, committees are finding that Zoom works really well for them. Others are finding that it doesn't. Some it's a mix. Some are, are sort of doing a hybrid. Um, so that's something that CPC will have to discuss. Um, but as far as the first point, I think it, the, CP, the CPA plan is really the distillation of the public's priorities and the city's priorities for CPA spending. And that the process for um, for that plan takes into account all of the long-term planning efforts that the city has undertaken with regard to all of the CPA um, program areas. So you, the affordable housing plan looks at the, uh, you, the affordable housing section looks at all of the comprehensive affordable housing documents that have been prepared to date through the housing partnership and others and same with the historic preservation and, um, and the other sections. So that, that longer document really attempts to you know, sort of summarize all of those priorities all into one place. And we also do a, a dedicated public comment session for the CPA plan itself, but it ha it typically has not gotten a lot of public input, maybe because people have participated in those other long-term planning efforts, um, maybe because it's not strictly related to projects, you know, hard to say. Um, so not quite, not sure if that answers your question, but maybe at least pieces of it. So uh, again, this is this feels like it could be a much longer conversation um, for, for reasons I, I'm also on the NHP, uh, the housing partnership. And I think it is fair to say that some members, perhaps many members are not altogether clear what their charter is. And they certainly don't feel as though they spend a lot of time talking with people who have similar overlapping complementary charters like we do, right? And so without 
you know, failing to rely on the people who do it full time and our professionals, you guys. Um, I just wonder if there is a way to enrich the cross <laughs> uh, advisory, if you will, uh, communication so that people have a sense, not just of articulated and often um, kind of abstract priorities, but when we say we want more affordable housing in, in Northampton, what the heck do we mean by that? And, and I just use that as an example, right? Um, more of any specific type, more can we say in terms of numbers, um, how far under where we would like to be do we think we are and what do we have to do to improve that? And again, I realize that this is not the time of night to have these conversations. I just, I just wonder where they are being held and if, um, it, well, this is not a criticism, please don't take it that way. I've just been seeking some transparency around the answers to these questions and um, I've not yet kind of found it. So yeah, I'll I mean, I'm, I'm not quite sure how much you're asking about the CPA and the CPC's role in those decision-making processes or if you're, well, if you're asking a sort of a broader well, let me give you, policy. yes, I am asking a broader question, but I, 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 I firmly believe having worked with many governments, um, ones that are functional and ones that are not, that if everybody's not rowing in the same direction, chances are you're not going to get to the place you want to be. And so the question I guess I'm asking you is who could say to me as a citizen, not to mention a member of a, um, a couple of boards, um, we have an aspiration to increase the affordable housing supply in the city of Northampton by X units per year for the next Y years. Is, is that number out there somewhere? Not in such a specific way. Yeah, I don't think. And I, mean, I know it's hard to put that. Yeah, number. I mean, there, there's a lot of overarching goals about you know what the housing gaps are and what's needed, yep. um, what should be created, and the CPC is is really a reactionary body that's making decisions about applications that are presented to it. Um, right. And I I think the quality of those applications really speaks to the background work that the city and its partners have done to make those projects happen. Um, but the, the CPC isn't directly so soliciting proposals like it happens in some typically smaller communities. Well, or even larger communities where the issue is that the CPC money doesn't even become close to what the demand is. So you have to make choices among, you know, equally or perhaps not equally compelling proposals in the context of an overall agenda. Anyways, I'm 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 going way too far. There's another hand up. I'd like to see the, but I, I would love I, I I hunger for a venue in which to to understand more about how this thinking goes. I I'm not sure what it is. You ask really good questions, Bev. Thank you, Chris. Oh uh, yeah, you do ask good questions, Bev, and and um, you know, eight forty one is the right time to do it because that's when we meet. Um, this is one of the conundrums I think that a lot of, a lot of, um, uh, local government entities have, which is how do you get the word out about the work that we do? Um, having served a, a, a couple of years now, um, both on both sides of the, uh, the, the COVID barrier, um, I would say actually that, and it's only marginal because our turnout, our public turnout is low at any point. Uh, it's probably been better um, post-COVID than pre. Uh, I think Zoom has been an opportunity for more people to participate rather than fewer. Um, I think what really drives um, public participation isn't the workings of CPC as a general entity. It's the specific topics uh, that we cover from time to time. And where we really see turnout is when a grant application is submitted that... Um, either raises the hackles of, 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 of a couple of our neighbors or uh, they strongly support it and they come out to speak in favor of it. And that's where we get our turnout is when uh, the, the proposals are, are 
uh, and they're and they're seldom controversial. I mean, the the you know the most recent one, the Holly Street Project, is about as is about as heated a discussion as 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 I've witnessed. But most of the time, um, we're in the fortunate position of not saying no to people, but saying yes to people. Um, our ability to dole out money does not rely on our obligation to cut anybody else's funding. You either win or you don't. Nobody loses. Um, and as a result of that, um, you know, the people who come in, there, there, there are sometimes, um, there are sometimes disappointment, but they're very seldom hurt feelings. Uh, so we don't, we don't generate the kind of controversy that brings people in to say like a city council meeting. Um, so where we do see it is, as I said, it's when, it's when uh, groups that have a proposal before us bring, you know, their supporters in um, for a public comment period and, and, uh, and, and generate their support or, you know, a letter writing campaign. And that's where we really see people. So for me, the, the, the big question is, how do we reach new audiences? And, and um, because the people that we see on a regular basis, we see on a regular basis. They know the routine, they come in, um, we've established a rapport with them, they know what our expectations are. Uh, it's getting the new kids on the block to come in that for me is, is where our obligation lies. And I, I, don't, I don't know what the answer is. I, I wish I did. What I do know from my limited experience in doing outreach in other, um, in other capacities is that it's hard work. Uh, it requires diligence and time. And to be perfectly honest with you, I don't necessarily have the bandwidth to do it to the level that I think it deserves. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if that, that was helpful in any way, but at, when I think of it, those are sort of the topics that come up in my mind. And I'm always glad to talk to anybody um, on the committee or off the committee about the work that we do and how to how to pursue it. Um, I, you know, I, I, I believe that that's a form of my constituent service, but uh, I don't go to door, you know, door to door knocking on doors saying to people, you know, there's money out here that you might want to avail yourselves of. So, so thank you. That that was all very useful. I would say that um, uh, two things have struck me. One, um, you know, how you spend your money is reflective of what you want to get done. And so as long as there's general public awareness among those who care to be involved, that the priorities are, you know, generally understood at least. Um, that's good. And then, yeah, you yeah, spend the money in that context. Um, it, it's, it's when um, people don't show up because they're not sure what the goals are, or if they don't know where the venue is to talk about them, then I think you get into, um, into the kind of, um, I don't know, disengagement that, that you don't want. So in any event, um, I, I also, I'll, I'll just say it, I'm new to this group. I haven't met any of you because we haven't been in a public setting. I know what I know about you from reading that you are sitting in this seat because XYZ organization um, sent you here. I don't know anything more about you. You don't know anything more about me. And so, the other question I have short of, you know, does COVID allow us to be together in any venue is how do we, how do we as a group get to know each other? And because I do think Zoom is pretty limited in that, um, in that uh, regard. And I keep promising myself I'm gonna shut up and I don't. Uh, I make a motion that we adjourn this meeting. Uh, that's, that's- I'm, I'm joking, the... but I'm sorry. Oh, oh. Okay. I'm happy to make that motion if you like. One, one thing, Bev, to answer the Zoom question, I think we we discussed at the very start of the of this round, or maybe it was in the summer, that we would continue Zooming through the end of the calendar year. Yep. And then we will uh, um, pose that question to us at our last meeting, which I think is December 7th, I believe. Um, and dis and decide whether or not we can move forward. And Sarah, legally, we can continue to move forward at least through the end of the fiscal year. Is that correct? I it's I believe so. Sometime in twenty twenty three. Okay, so legally, we can do that, whether we want to or not. We shall see. 
Any other ideas on this <clears throat> challenging question, Martha? Yeah, Bev, I just wanted to say um, hello. I was not able to attend the last meeting, so it's so nice to meet you. And um, Linda, who we all adored, uh, said great things about you. So thank you for joining us. And uh, I just wanted to offer some encouragement. I think I've been on the committee, I, I don't remember, four years maybe. And I think that um, I've learned so much about the other members just by listening to their thoughtful comments over the years. Um, you really do... For me, it's been eye-opening, um, not only to learn about the expertise they have and the thoughts they have, but also just who they are as people. So I would I would hold out a little hope that you'll gain that knowledge. And then also, it's fine to ask a lot of questions because we've all been there new, and uh, we all went through that. So that's it. And I'll second your motion. So I think as we come up with any ideas, any brainstorms, uh, regarding outreach, passing them on to Sarah or Carolyn is a good idea. Uh, we can't uh, can't thank them enough for the work that they do, but there's always other ideas out there. I think, again, citizen engagement and trying to be as transparent as possible is essential to facilitate the good work that we do. Any other outreach suggestions, issues? If they come up as they come up, Jeff. Um, real quick, um, I appreciate all the comments that have been made as far as this this topic. But I mean, Sarah sends out a lot of um, invites um, to committee members to come out. That like um, Brian was talking about Laurel Park, and I always read those things and I get all excited, and then I look at my calendar and it's like. I can't make that one because I'm doing whatever. But maybe if there's a way we could we could promote those even more. And we don't like it was referenced that we don't get the media coverage when we put out, you know, press releases. And maybe there's a way to work with the recipients of our funds who are having the event in question to try and better promote, you know, whatever they're whatever they're doing. Um, so that we get mentioned and it's you know, it's like here's another example of what this committee does um and in some of these some of these projects we we funded them repeatedly um over the years um so there's a historical track record that could be referenced and this is this is what we do um but you know just a, just a thought just thinking out loud Sarah, I think you should go and remove the peg that you hammered in in the shepherd barn and have it dangle over the entrance so <laughs> everyone can see that it is a CPC project. I'll, it was I'll, nice demand, I'll demand an additional peg. Let's get photos. That's right. <laughs> I did it take was, pictures of the peg, which I can okay. look at everyone. It was nice, Jeff, when I did the Laurel Park thing that the the signage very prominently mentioned CPC. Yeah, I, so, I think that stuff's really good. Yeah, so that's 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 really important. Um, Jen, are you twirling your hair, or is that a raising? A oh, hand it's just a fidget. But we we I did have a question. We've requested that in the past too, right? That signage or that people like mention us or our funding. Yeah, so th that's a part of the contracts that grantees okay. sign, um, and everyone is always happy to do it in North historic Northampton has come to get additional signs over the years and people always ask what the preferred wording is and they're they're really happy to spread the word that mm -hmm. CPA was, was a portion of their funding Go ahead. yeah I'm, I'm just reflecting on the uh, long spreadsheet that we see periodically behind all the other spreadsheets of all the projects we've funded and all the people who go to all the places for all the projects we've funded. So, you know, I drive by Florence Fields or walk down Florence Fields with great frequency and see hundreds of children out on the fields. Um, and I know there's a sign in one far corner of the field uh, and, 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 you know, for every hundred children, uh, one, two, three parents and grandparents and friends and other people. So I'm, I'm just wondering if, if there's a way to start to go back and publicize our work through projects com 
completed not just recent projects, you know, um, but but some of the some of the projects that that have been around the block for a long time. Some that we may even have paid off our uh, our bonding on, right? Mm -hmm. um, some really old projects that are are high citizen use. Uh, Florence Fields, the Academy, uh, Historic Northampton, and and obviously many, many ways in which we have actually put money toward uh, affordable housing in Northampton. Yeah, we certainly could do that. Um, Julia, are you envisioning that this might be part of like our, our listserv and social media blast? Or did you have something in particular? Yeah, no, I'm, I, I'm, I'm thinking about all the ways we do, you know, like, Okay, so periodically, I, Parks and Rec, periodically we run these events where we celebrate Northampton. We have probably one coming up in December, the one downtown, we close the streets, lots of people out on the streets. And I just sort of envision somehow a celebrate CPC, what, you know, not just celebrate Northampton, but hey, do you know about this funding group and what we've funded over the years and we're funding all the things that you're using and biking on and walking by and living in and um, uh, going to the theater at. So I'm just really thinking about trying to make sure not just that people know we exist, but people know the impact. They tend to know the impact, you know, at Laurel Park, for instance, great event, lots of people there. And there's that moment where they know our impact and it's like, okay, and now it's done. Would would you suggest like at the uh, you know shutting down Main Street in Florence or Northampton having a CPC table something like that? Uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you were out at at Florence Night Out, and again, that was not Parks and Rec. That was a that's done just through Florence Civic Association. But if you're out at those events, it is amazing the number of people from from our our community that that show up. Whether again, it was a uh, you know, the fourth celebration up at Look Park, which may or may not happen again. Um, the holiday celebration downtown where the streets shut down. Is that we, happening we get again? This out. Is that, um, is... I think we're in the plans. I'll, I'll go to a meeting and tell you. I'll go yeah. to a meeting next week and then I'll tell you. Because that's certainly one thing. It's, uh, one or two of us should just sit at a table and just... Um, make it known yeah. of our presence. I think it's a great idea. And we could update the banners to include some photos and a QR code, at least to the website. Mm -hmm. are, are we coming up on any sort of anniversary, 15th year, 20th year? When did we start? I, think it's... I was thinking that same thing. Like, again, celebrate CPC, you know, get the it's word out. 17 years, I think this fall. Mm -hmm. That's it's magic. So like the 17th year locust, isn't it? Or is it the seven year locust? <laughs> the 17th year CBC. Cicadas. Cicadas, that's what I was. <laughs> uh, so let's think about that. At the next major road closing, Main Street closing, in Florence or Northampton or Look Park, of if, if we could table an event like that with a couple of us. Um, that might be fun. Any other suggestions? I was just going to say oh, right. that, uh, yeah. that to add to that, what what if some event were synced with the production of a film, perhaps funded with students or or enabling students to make a film about all of these assets that we've uh, community assets that we've helped produce. Uh, and that could be hosted on a website and 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 links of it could be sent around with a press release that, again, say 20th anniversary could be or could just be whenever. But, uh, you know, some visuals of these places would go a long way and, you know, filmed anecdotes of people experiencing these things and talking about them would go a long way towards um, painting the whole picture of uh, the value that we add. And if we did something silly enough, it could go viral on YouTube. And uh, there we would be just jettisoned into the social media frenzy that would drive us somewhere. So whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, but yeah, 
any movie makers out there or ideas for some sort of visual, audio visual event would be great. Any other comments, suggestions? All right, well, thank you for that discussion. Uh, moving right along, any other business not foreseen when the agenda was published? Uh, Bev, you can be up now with your motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. And I second and, uh, it. A bunch of seconds that are out there. Great. And uh, we will see you at the, and generally we have the entire session reserved for just public comment. We found that if we start to debate uh, agenda, uh, uh, applicants uh, and then don't get through it, then we've forgotten all that happened. So I think we're just going to keep the meeting on the, what do you say, the 16th uh, to the public comment session. And then hopefully on December 7th, be able to get through all, what is it, 12 of our, of our applications. So we'll hope that that's able to happen. That might be a long meeting on, the, on December the 7th. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Good meeting. We'll see you in two weeks.